Oh, today we're going to take a little dive into the Lord's Prayer just a little bit. Now, I'd love to say we could do it all, but I'm going to take our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to open that just a little bit. I'd love to camp out several weeks just there, but uh, why it's important for us to know who we're praying to. And I would venture to say that a lot of us sometimes have a distorted view of what our Heavenly Father is like. And uh, I believe God would like today to bring some clarity so that when we pray to our Father, we know uh, what it is to whom we're praying and why it's important that we understand that. So, again, years ago when I first met my wife, Sarah, of 40 years of marriage this year, where's my wife, Sarah? Okay, Sarah, well, she's not going to raise her hand. There she is, way back there. Woohoo! 40 years. <clears throat> Sarah, one more time. So, but this woman has tolerated me for 40 years. She's had, she's had to cultivate a prayer life because she's had to forgive me many times. Amen? You're married too, brother. You know what I'm talking about. Right? So, it's a good thing. In order to walk with somebody 40 years, you have to learn to love and to forgive and to, to hang in there and to remain faithful and to have faith and all those things. But when my wife first met me, my favorite verse was Matthew chapter 6, 33. And she did something back in those days called cross-stitch. And so when we first started dating, she cross-stitched me, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Now, what that verse, let's finish what the summary of that verse is. The summary is this, that everything that you need for life and godliness, God said he'll add to you. But it is conditional. The conditions are these. If you'll seek first his kingdom and walk righteously before him, if you'll seek God's kingdom and walk righteously before him, God says, I'll add everything to you that you need for life. So, but a lot of times we're asking God, God, give me everything that I need for life, and we're forgetting the first two steps. So first of all, it starts with you having a relationship with God to such a degree that you know him not as the God of the universe, but you know him as your God, as your Savior, as your friend, as your Father. Right? So it's important that we have a right relationship with God. And it says, seek first his kingdom. And now what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is his will, his lordship, his plan, his purpose in our life. Not just the overall thing, but every day concerning everything. So God says, God, let your kingdom come and <clears throat> let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're going to talk about the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, righteousness is, now, when we, as a believer in Jesus, when, when we ask Jesus to be our Savior, what we're doing is we're saying, God, I'm going to stop trusting in my ability to be good because I can't be good enough. How many of you found out you can't be good enough? If you ever have done one thing wrong, you're not good enough. But what God did is because he desired relationship with his children, for eternity, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And the wrath that was due for your sins, God says, all we like sheep have gone astray, and God hath laid on him, on Jesus Christ, my sin, your sins, and the wrath that we were due, God took it. It's called propitiation, that God took the wrath. But what happened is it said that we were, at that time, were justified by faith. When I gave and said, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm not trying just to be a good person, but God, I surrender. I, I want your kingdom, your lordship over my life. I, by faith, give you my life. I trust you. You're saying I surrender and to God's kingdom. And it says that when God says, I write your name in heaven, you're justified. Now, how many of you know when you're born again, there's still some stuff. Where God forgives me of my sin, past, present, future, but it's called the process of sanctification. Sanctification is when God's taken the old man, the old you, and turning it into the new man, which is new in Christ. When you're born again, it says you become a child of God. And God begins that process of taking the old stuff, 
that stuff that we need to get rid of, and he begins to purify it, sanctify it. So when we begin to walk righteously is when we find out what is God's will, his truth, his word, and not because we're ever going to measure up, but because of his love for us, we begin to walk in right relationship with God. And so his kingdom, his righteousness, that means I'm walking in right relationship with God. When God speaks to me about an area in my life, I'm changed from the inside out, and my life begins, there begins to be this convergence of God's presence, God's protection, God's provision, and God's power. I'm going to make a pretty bold statement. I think the normal Christian life should be a consistent learning to walk with God on a daily basis, learning how to hear what is God's will, what God wants to do in his kingdom, and then you aligning your life with what God is saying. And if there's stuff in you that needs to change, then God's saying, I'll give you the power. And when you allow God's plan, God's kingdom, his righteousness to form in you, and you're walking not doing your will, but the will of the Father, then God's power begins to show up in your life. So we're going to talk about prayer today. And Jesus' life was marked by this. Early in the morning, he'd get up and go for prayer. He'd find out what was on God's will. And he'd go from one time of prayer to an encounter with the power of God being used through him. Do you think that God wants to do that in and through every one of his children? The answer is yes. It's not for the special chosen, but it's for his children. Now, <clears throat> Jesus was so devoted to prayer, it was who he was, that it's like this. In those days, they didn't have the, uh, a watch. They had a sundial, but they said you, you, you could tell the day by where the sun was, but you could set your sundial on Jesus' consistency to prayer. Let's look at it. Mark 135. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. So Jesus, if you wanted to find Jesus, wherever you were, because they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have, have uh, phone lines, wherever you were, you could go and find God because Jesus was always in a place of prayer in the morning. Luke 15, 16, it says, but Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. Mark, Matthew 14, 23. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray, and when it was evening, he was there alone. There are 29 Bible verses that talk about Jesus went to pray. There was such a consistency that you could count on it like clockwork. In fact, Judas when it came time to portray Jesus, knew that he went to the high priest, took the Roman soldiers, and he says, let's go to the Garden of Gethsemane at this time because I know that my Lord will be there. And so Judas betrayed Jesus because his consistency of prayer. Daniel in the Old Testament, everybody knew when I was going to nail him. He went open, and he opened the windows so everybody could see. He says, guys, I'm praying. If you're going to do something, come do it but I am going to follow my God, all right? So there's a consistency. And so what happened is the disciples saw that this habit pattern always produced a supernatural power encounter. And so what Jesus did every morning before it was yet light, he got up, he says, God, I want to know you. He cultivated his relationship with God. And he says, Lord, not my will, but your will, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so what Jesus did every day, everybody say every day? He got the marching orders from God. He got God's presence into his life to such a degree that he went out and every day he had a power encounter. I believe the normal Christian life should be every day getting your life in line with God's will. His presence, his perspective, his marching orders, Making sure that if you're there, if you're in God's presence, he's going to show you some things that aren't where they need to be. Maybe you have some attitude that needs to be adjusted. Some unforgiveness or something he's going to use you for. And you just have to take that time and get right with God. 
You know, the cool thing about God, God is a loving father. And it's like when you have things in your life, he wants you to get rid of the stuff that you shouldn't have there. He wants to put the God in and get the bad out, right? So, so here at Grace, one of the things that we feel is one of the most important things for you is to cultivate, cultivate an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus. Pastor Ryan Peterson has been, for the last four weeks, sharing with you about how to begin to read your Bible and let the Bible read you. And then we, he, we, in fact, we gave you journals out and say, one of the keys is not just getting up and spending time, but it's learning how to encounter God, learning how to hear God's voice to such a degree that you're able to begin to write down. And as you begin to journal, you begin to write down, pretty soon you're able to start to hear his will. Because a lot of Christians, I hate to say it, spend their whole life in church loving God, but they don't know how to hear God's voice. But if you'll learn how to cultivate the habit of spending time, my sheep know my voice, John chapter 15. God wants you to know his voice. And it's a habit that you have to discipline yourself and cultivate. After a while, you begin to just know it. You begin to walk in it. So it's like at, at work and somebody does something, there's something inside of you, the Holy Spirit inside of you tells you, don't do that, don't respond. Or God will kind of warn you, he'll protect. I mean, it's just all the time, every day. And so you will have. So what Jesus did is he, 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 uh, he, show, he showed you how to spend time and, and he would go in prayer and everybody goes, man, I, they didn't know how Jesus did it. And so one day he said, hey, uh, Jesus, we see this, you spend time with God, power. You spend time with God, power. You spend time with God, power. And they says, would you help us out? We'd kind of like to know how to pray like you pray because we want that in our life. How many of us would like to know how to have God's presence, God's peace, God's protection, God's power in our life? Amen? Amen. <clears throat> James 5, 5, 16 says, the effective, fervent prayer of a what? A righteous man has great impact. That means I'm walking right with God, asking God for the things that he's showing me. And when I'm asking and my life is in alignment, God's power shows up. Now, I would like to ask a question. I want a response by hand. How many of you would say you need to pray more? All right. There was a, a study done, survey taken of over 250,000 believers in Jesus. And they asked him, what was the most important thing that if someone was to help them with, what would it be? 83% of those believers said, I don't understand how to connect with God. I don't know how to hear God's voice. That's why we're camping out here helping you because it will be one of the best things if you'll learn how to master this area and make it a, a, a major part of your life. It will be the best thing that I will tell you for your family, your future, your faith, nothing in the future that the world can give or Satan can give that you won't have God's guidance. Now, why do most people not pray? Sometimes they feel ashamed or sometimes they feel like they've sinned or done something that God can't forget. How many of you have ever felt like God can't forgive you for something you've done. Satan always makes, he always says, therefore there's, this is what scripture says, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. What's that mean? When we ask God forgiveness, for, for forgiveness, he forgives. Satan always comes to condemn. And whenever we ask God to forgive us, Satan always makes the feel, you're not good enough, you're not worthy enough, God doesn't love you anymore. And anybody besides me ever felt those things? Oh, uh, yesterday? <clears throat> so, but again, there's a lot of reasons when we, when we come to pray and we say, our father. Sometimes some of us didn't always grow up with good fathers. And there's some stuff in our fathers that we didn't like that left a lot of hurt. You can even grow up in a good Christian home. My, my kids grew up in a good Christian home. But there's still stuff in life because of sin that I know hurt my children, hurt my spouse. And God wants to get that stuff out of us. And it's an ongoing until the day we die. God wants to get rid of that stuff. But if we deal with it every day, it doesn't pile up. But if we don't deal with it, it hurts us and it hurts those around us. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to actually pray the Lord's Prayer. Uh, since I gave my life to Jesus about 45 years ago, I learned it in the old King James Version. So guess what you get to learn today? We're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. I want you to repeat after me. But I want you to say it so loud enough that you can't hear your neighbor. Is that okay? So if you would, the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, 9 through 13, and also Luke, cha- Luke chapter, uh, well, I'll look it up here in a second. Luke chapter 9. But it, <clears throat> our Father, okay. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <clears throat> thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory glory. forever Forever. and forever and forever and forever forever. forever. amen amen Amen. Amen. the Lord's prayer starts with you talking to our father not just my father he is my father but he's talking to our Father. It's, it's a two-way conversation where we start communing with God and then God starts communing with us. Now, I grew up in a tradition where saying the Our Father or other prayers was you had to say it 25 times depending on how many sins you had. The more, the more sins you, you sin, the more times you had to say Our Father. Now, guys, let me tell you, that's not scriptural. It's not just repeating. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to attack anything. It's just not in the Bible. It, it, the, it's not repeating the words. It's praying the prayer. It's not how many times I repeat the words. It's by connecting to God and praying what the words mean. Now, just a question. How many of us, when we were quoting the Lord's Prayer, we were actually saying, my father, forgive me of my debts as I forgive others of their debts or their trespasses or their sins and lead me not into temptation and deliver me from evil. How many of us, when we prayed it, we said us, but in reality, I was saying me? Have you ever seen this before? Have you ever thought about that? I want to ask the question, why does God teach us to pray us? Now, Should we pray for individual prayers? In fact, if you'll just jump back in Matthew chapter 6, a couple verses ahead of that, Matthew chapter 5, we just, uh, the Lord's Prayer was verse 9, when Jesus was starting to talk about prayer that led to the conversation about teach us to pray, this is what Jesus told his disciples. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. In other words, God's not going to answer their prayers. But you, when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, you, and pray to your father in private. Then your father who sees everything will reward you. In other words, does God want me to pray for my needs specifically? Yes. But then why does God tell us to pray the plural side of our Father. Our Father said this, our Father, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. There are eight personal prayer pronouns that when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he didn't teach them pray me. He told us to pray us and we. Why is that so? Why is that so? Now, when we receive Christ, Jesus becomes my Savior. But when I receive Christ as my Savior, I become a part of God's family worldwide. 
the ecclesia, as they call it, the called out ones. The Holy Spirit comes in, lives and dwells in within, within me. God right, says, your sins are forgiven, past, present, future. And Randy Thornton's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it's not because of what I did, it's because of what Jesus did. Now, why does God teach us to pray? Because when we come together praying the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> we're praying as part of God's family. Now, when I pray the Lord's Prayer, our Father, then I know that God sees my spouse, who's also a believer, and God also sees my children, but God also sees us, the Grace Church family. And when I pray us, God also is praying for the us, is the, the believers worldwide are praying in agreement that how our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Guess what? How many of you have ever had a bad day and you're just, Lord, I, I, I know I'm supposed to be praying, but right now the us is not there and you need to carry this. How many of you know when we pray us, all the prayers of the saints around the world are coming together praying for you, for God's kingdom, for God's purpose. Can I get an amen here? How many of us have not seen the Lord's Prayer from the plural side? This may change your life. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3, 14 through 15. For this reason I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Ephesians 2, 19, it says, you are members of God's very own family and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. You cannot live the Christian life as a lone ranger. God has, has called us, forsake not, Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the fellowship of the saints. God's called us to walk together in unison with God's people so that the power of God can be released. Again, I'm gonna get ahead of myself, but Matthew 18, 19, the power of Christ, whenever it says, whenever two to, or three people come together agreeing to, on any one thing, which is his kingdom, his will, Whenever we come together, Matthew 18, 19, let's read it. Again, I say to you that if two of you, two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, done by my, our Father in heaven. It will be done. In other words, God says, when you guys come in, finding out what's in what my kingdom Orders are, my kingdom will is for that day, for that situation, for that problem, for that decision. And then you guys hear what God wants to do. You begin to align your life and two or three begin together and pray, God, your kingdom come about that situation, about that marriage, about that financial situation. When God says, I'm going to do that, you begin to align your life and pray. You'll go from a place of spending time in prayer to an encounter with the almighty God. And when we pray us, it's not just your prayers, but it's all the saints that have been praying for the thousands of years are being poured out. Remember Acts chapter one and two, all the believers, 120 of them were all gathered together, fear of persecution, and they all came together in unity, in prayer. And what happened is the presence of God showed up the day of Pentecost, and God's power filled them, and they went out doing signs and wonders. And that became the norm of the normal Christian life. They came together in unity, agreeing together in prayer what God wanted to do. Hey, guys, I'm sending you. Go to Jerusalem and wait for me there because I'm gonna send the, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Dunamis, and fill you with power. They came together. They heard God's marching orders. They began to align their life with, so they came, they obeyed what God told them to do. They were all gathered together in unison, in one accord, in prayer, and guess what happened? The power of God fell. Is it important for us to know how to align our life with what God is saying? Step out in obedience, step out in faith, and then begin to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
and all these things shall be added to you. Let's talk about the word hallowed. The Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be the name. Now, the word hallowed is all throughout the Old Testament. It's over 30 times in the New Testament. There's two times in the New Testament in <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6, Six and Luke chapter 11 where the Lord's Prayer is mentioned. The two times where the word, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, in the Lord's Prayer, the, it's a Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word there means to set apart or to make holy. The other 26 times, so the word hallowed means to make holy, to sanctify, to consecrate, to honor as holy, consider sacred. So whenever we say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, the word literally means to set apart as holy, to honor as sacred. It's, it's not common, okay? Now, the 26 times in the New Testament where we read the word hallow or hallowed, it means to sanctify. So in other words, when we see the word sanctify or hallowed, the word in the Greek is God Hallowed be your name, sanctify your name. So when we're saying hallowed, is God saying you're setting apart, God is holy, and yet at the same time, God says, sanctify my name. God says, I am sanctifying my name in you as holy. God says, I am, I am as you pray, hallowed be thy name, I am sanctifying my name in you, my power in you. So when we're praying the Lord's Prayer, God is, we're worshiping God, honoring God, thanking God for choosing us to be his children. But it's also God's power being released back into our life and he's sanctifying me, all right? <clears throat> now, again, Hallowood, especially in the Old Testament or in the Lord's Prayer, always was used to show the opposite of the profane. In other words, how many of you know the Ten Commandments, right? In the Ten Commandments, one of the, the big Ten Commandments is, Thou shall not use the Lord thy God's name in. One of the big top ten, right? Now, when most people don't realize it, but when you use God's name in vain, and you're condemning or judging or damning God's name, what you're doing literally is saying, God, I don't need your help. I don't need your protection. I am condemning you, and what you're doing is literally... You're opening a door to Satan to say, Satan, you come in and judge me and all the wrath that is due you. I'm opening the door for you to bring devastation on my life. Now, I think some of us probably ought to tighten that area up a little bit. Because sometimes it's a loose word. But God says, thou shall not use the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Hallowed be my name. And when you're, when you're cursing God's name, you're also receiving the judgment that th that curse deserves. Judge not, lest you be what? Judged. So, I think God wants to elevate his name as holy. And when we pray, hallowed be thy name, God's saying, set apart my name as holy. Set it apart as sacred. Let me give you an Old Testament verse. Again, many times, you're always going to see the word hallowed and sanctify in, in the same type of verse, used together. Leviticus 22, 32. Let's go ahead and pull that up. Leviticus 22, 32. It says, you shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who, what? Sanctified defies you. Let me read that one more time. You shall not profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed. I will be set apart among the children of Israel. I am the God that sanctifies you. When we hallow God's name, it releases his power to come in and sanctify us, purify us, make us right in right relationship with God and right relationship with man. Amen? So point number one, God is our father. Now, point number two is Satan is a bad father. Now, there are two fathers on this planet. There's God, our father. And for those who, when the day you receive Jesus Christ as your savior, God becomes your father. 
until that time, Satan is your father. In fact, Satan's called the Lord of this earth, the father of this world. All that is of sin is of your father, the devil. All right? Now, what God says, it says, <clears throat> we all were born into this world with an earthly father and mother. Now, when we're born into this world, we're born of our father of the world, so there's sin in us. Anybody here ever done anything wrong? That comes from your father, the devil. The devil made me, yes, he did. All right? And all the good that is in you comes from our heavenly father. Now, I have four children. They were raised in a Christian home, but I know that I was an imperfect father. But this I do know. All the good that was in me, all the truth, all the love, all the, the things that were right came from God. And all the bad things in me, when I didn't respond properly or I didn't do what I need to do or said things that I shouldn't have, all those came from where? Our Father, not our Father in heaven, but the God of this world, Satan. Okay? Now, in life, a lot of people, when we say our Father who is in heaven, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, what we do is we bring with that connotation when we say our Father. Some of us didn't have good fathers. Or some of us have hurtful memories of either neglect or abuse or absenteeism. But that is not our Father in heaven. That's our earthly Father. And all the good that was in your dad that was from God. And all the bad was from Satan. So sometimes even growing up as spiritual leaders, if you had a, 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 a spiritual leader that all he told you was you're going to go to hell and you're not good enough and you're not worthy, that's not from God. So what God wants to do is he wants to change our attitude about him. God is holy, and he is to be set apart. Let me give you an example. You remember when the children of Israel grew up in a pagan Egyptian culture, God says, I want to set my people free. He sends Moses. Moses, they take him across the Red Sea, and then God sends him up to the mountain to worship God, and it took 40 days, and he gave him the Ten Commandments. Before Moses got down to the bottom of the mountain, they'd already built a calf and started worshiping worshiping the pagan gods of Egypt. And God says, man, I want to wipe them out. But Moses knew God's nature. Moses knew God. He says, God, if you're going to wipe them out, you're going to have to wipe me out too. Now, did God want to wipe them out? No, he wanted to wipe their sin out. God took them from Egypt into the promised land to get them the Egypt out into the promises of God so they could have relationship with God forever. Right? So, Moses realized that, you know, in fact, God realized this, their sin. That's why he gave them the Ten Commandments. Moses got mad, broke the Ten Commandments. And God said, okay, next time, buddy, you get to go chisel the rock. Last time I gave you the rock, now you get to go chisel it yourself. How many did Moses send to? Did God still love Moses? God's call and destiny is to draw people into a right relationship. So, but Moses would go up and God would call Moses, come up to the mountain, spend time with me prayer, my presence. And then, but Moses said, God would say, always consecrate yourself because you're walking on holy ground. And then God would tell, tell the children of Israel, said, don't even come up to the mountain because you're not consecrated. You're not prepared. Don't even let your animals go because if you come up, you can't stand before a holy God. Now, we're kind of stuck. How many of you have ever sinned? Okay, and if you're not, you're lying. So Matthew 5, 48 be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Right? None of us are perfect. But yet God wants us to walk in right relationship. And we can't walk in right relationship because none of us are perfect. So what God did is God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for our sins, to pay for my sins, to pay for your sins, to take the judgment. Then when God, we walk into God's presence, God doesn't see my sin. He sees the blood of Jesus. You know, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he uttered this word, teltelestai. And what does that mean in the Greek? It says the debt has been paid. It's an emphatic in the Greek. It says the debt has been paid. It's been paid completely. It's been paid to the utmost. What God did 
After that, Jesus uttered the cross. The clouds formed. There was an earthquake. Now, the temple where God's presence was, it was the outer courts, the inner courts, a curtain. It was either 40 or 80 foot tall. It was about eight inches thick of goat hair and all this, and it was so, so big, so thick, it took horses to pull it open. It says the only time the, 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 the curtain in the temple was opened up was once a month the priest would have to go through a consecration process, purification process, and then he would go stand before God and represent the people and, and ask God to forgive their sins and pray for the people and pray for the nation. And then, but what happened is some of the priests apparently didn't get too consecrated, and so what they would do is they would tie a rope around the priest's leg, and when he went in, just in case he wasn't in right relationship and God struck him dead, they would pull him out. Ooh, that's a little bit scary, huh? <laughs> kind of like a... <laughs> okay. God says, I will be set apart. But when Jesus died on the cross, what he did was he tore the curtain from the top to the bottom and separated it. So now, no longer did people need to go through a priest for the forgiveness of sins. They could walk right into the presence of the Holy of Holies where God was. Why? Not because they were good enough, but because Jesus Christ paid for their sins. So when we pray, our Father, we're taking, now, again, when we talk about our Father, we talk about, you know, the, we know the Trinity. We know, when we think of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, right? So, when we pray, we're praying to God, all three in one. But a lot of times when we talk about God the Father, He's the mean one. He's not the mean one. When we talk about God the Son, Jesus, He's the nice one. And God, the Holy Spirit, he's the weird one. <laughs> he's not weird. But when sometimes the Holy Spirit gets in some people, weird people do weird things. How many of you know some weird people? The Holy Spirit's not weird. What happened on the day of Pentecost was that the believers were gathered already there. The Holy Spirit came upon them and the power of God was released. Guys, when we pray our Father, we're coming into agreement with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God says, you've got it all. And when you pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, set apart, sanctify me. Bring me in right relationship with you. Lord, may you be considered holy. May your name be exalted. And the only reason I can call you Father is because you've become my Father through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Ooh, Hallelujah. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Do you see one of the keys to God's power is finding out what is God's will and aligning your will. I bow my knee. That means I submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, guys, I need to quit. I have, I just got to the introduction. No, I, 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 love, I love God's people. I love God's, there's so much truth in today's message. And I don't know why you're here today. For some of you, you may know the Lord like I did. I was in church for years and years, and I knew God here didn't hear. Then one day, God became my father, our father, my heavenly father. It's not somebody I knew about, but somebody, it's like this. I became God's favorite kid, just like you became God's favorite kids. But some of you aren't God's favorite kids. Oh, he loves you. That's why you're here today, and he wants you to give your life to him. You are his favorite kid. And God wants a personal relationship with you.